Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Imam and friends. So today, me and my friends uh, are going to do a presentation on scaling and questionnaire development in quantitative research design. My name is Lastasha Zahradin. My name is Theodore Gilbert. And my name is Zafira Fiona Islami. Next, please. So we're gonna discuss uh, measurement and scale, how to develop proper questionnaire, types of questionnaire and administration, validity and reliability in quantitative research. First is measurement and scale. So uh, we're gonna first discuss about the nature of attitude and their relationship to behavior. The attitude behavior relationship is not straightforward. Although there may be close linkages, attitudes and behavioral intention do not always lead to actual behaviors. And although attitudes and behavior are expected to become to be consistent with each other, that is not always the case. Moreover, behaviors can influence attitudes. For example, Marketers know that a positive experience with a product or service reinforces a positive attitude or makes a customer question a negative attitude. This is one reason that restaurants where you have a bad dining experience may give you a coupon or a free meal on your next visit. They know a bad experience contributes might lead to formation of negative attitudes. Next, please. So uh, there are several factors that have an effect on the applica applicability of attitudinal risk. First is specific attitudes are better predictors of behavior than general ones. Uh, strong attitudes or strength is affected by accessibility or how well the object is remembered and brought to consciousness, how extreme the attitude is, or the degree of confidence in that are better predictors of behavior than weak attitudes composed of little intensity or topical interest. Direct experiences with the attitude object, when attitude is formed during repeated exposure or through reminders, produce behavior more reliably. Next. Cognitive-based attitudes influence behavior better than affective-based attitudes. Affective-based attitudes are often better predictors of consumption behavior. Using multiple measurement of attitude or several behavioral assessments across time and environments improve prediction. The influence of reference groups, interpersonal support, urges of compliance, peer pressure, and the individual's inclination to conform to these influences improve the attitude behavior. Next. Next, we have uh, selecting a measurement scale. Selecting and constructing a measurement scale requires the consideration of several factors that influence reliability, validity, and practicality of the scale, which is research ob objective, response type, data properties, number of dimension, balance or unbalance, force or unforced choices, number of scale points, and red error. Next, please. The first one we're going to talk about is research objective. Uh, research objective are two numerous lists, including, including studies of attitude, attitude change, persuasion, awareness, purchase intention, and etc. Researchers, however, face two general type of scaling objective. The first one is to measure characteristic of the participant who participates participate in the study and to use participant as ju judges of the objects or indic indicants present presented to them. Uh, here in the book we have an example to assuming that we're, we're con con conducting a study of consumer concerning their attitudes toward a change in corporate identity which in this case is a company logo. In the first study objective uh, our skill will be the measure of the customer orientation as favorable or unfavorable. We might combine each person's answer to form an indicator of overall orientation. And the, the emphasis in the first study is on measuring at altitudinal differences among people. With the second objective, we might use the same data, but we are now interested in how satisfied people are with design options. Next. 
response type. Measurement skills fall into four general types, which is ranking, weighting, categorization, and sorting. A rating skill is used when participants score an object or indica indicate without making a direct comparison to another object or attitude. Ranking skills constrain the study participant to making a comparison and determining order among two or more properties or ind indicates or objects. While categorization asks participants to put themselves or property indicates in groups or categorize. And sorting it requires the the participant sort cards that represent concept or construct into PAL using criteria established by the researcher. Next. Then we have data properties and number of dimension. And data properties is the decision about the choice of measurement scales are often made with regard to the data properties generated by each scale. And we have nominal scales, ordinal scales, interval scales, and ratio. And nominal scales, it classifies data into categorized categories without indicating order, distance, or unique origin. And ordinal data, it shows relationship of more than and less than but have no distance or unique origin. Interval scales have both order and distance but no unique origin. While ratio scales possess all four properties. The assumption underlying each level of scale determine how a particular measurement scale's data will be analyzed statistically. A number of dimension measurement scales are either unidimensional or multidimensional. And unidimensional scale one seeks to measure only one attribute to the participant or object. Another case is one measure of an actor's star power is his or her ability to carry a movie. It is a single dimension. Several items may be, may be used to measure this dimension and by combining them into a single measure, an agent may place client along a linear continuum of star power. While a multidimensional scale recognizes that an object might be better described with several dimensions than on an un unidimensional continuum. For example, the actual star power variable might be better expressed by three distinct dimensions. Ticket sales, speed of attracting financial resources, and media bus. Next. A balanced rating scale has an equal number of category categories above and below the midpoint. It generally should be balanced with an equal number of favorable and unfavorable response choices. It may be balanced with or without an indifference midpoint. It might take the form of very good, good, average, poor, and very poor, while an unbalanced rating scale has an equal number of favorable and unfavorable response. An example of an unbalanced scale that has only one favor favorable descriptive term and four favorable favorable term is poor, fair, good, very good, and excellent. The scale designer expects that mean ratings will be near good and that there, there will be a symmetrical distribution of answer around that point. The use of an unbalanced rating scale can be justified in studies which researchers know in advance that nearly all participants' score will, be, will lean in one direction or the other. And, and an unbalanced scale can help compensate for the error of leniency created by such waiters, which is the easy waiters or hard waiters. Next, an, an unforced choice rating scale provides participants with an opportunity to express no opinion when they are unable to make a choice among alternative offers, while a forced choice rating scale requires that participants select one of the offered alternatives. They often exclude the response choice like no opinion, undecided, don't know, uncertain, or neutral. Next, a number of scale points. A scale should be appropriate for its purpose. For a scale to be useful, it, it should match the stimulus presented and extract information proportionate to the complexity of the attitude, object, concept, and or construct. The last one is rate of rate errors. 
which is the value of rating scale, depend on the assumption that a person can and will make good judgment. Some raters are reluctant to give extreme judge, judgment, and this fact accounts for the error of central tendency. Participant must also be easy rater or hard rater, making what is called an error of leniency. This error must often occur when the rater, rater does, doesn't know the object or the property being rated. To address this tendency, researchers can adjust the strength of descriptive adjective, space the intermediate descriptive phase, phrases farther apart, provide smaller differences in meaning between the steps near the end of the scale than between the step near the center, and use more points in the scale. So now I'm gonna explain about uh, the rating scales. So in the rating scales, there's the simple category scale, which is also called the dictonomous scale that offers two mutually exclusive response choices. Uh, this response strategy is particularly useful for demographic questions or where a dictonomous response is adequate. And when there are multiple options for the rater, but only one answer is sought, the multiple choice single response scale is appropriate. And the, the example that is um, uh, in the book uh, has five options. The primary alternative should encompass 90% of the range with the other category completing the participants list. And when there's no possibility for an other response or exhaustiveness of categories is not critical, the other response may be omitted. And both the multiple choice single response scale and the simple category scale will produce nominal data. And a, a variation, the multiple choice on the multiple response scale allows the reader to select one or several alternatives. Uh, with the cumulative feature of the scale can be beneficial when a complete picture of the participant's choice is desired, but it may also present a problem for reporting when research sponsors expect the 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 response to sum to a hundred percent. And now I'm going to explain about the SD scales. So SD scales is a it uh, is short for semantic semantic differential scales, which is uh, which measures the psychological meanings of an attitude object using bipolar adjectives. So researchers use the scale for studies such as brand and institutional image, and the method consists of a set of a bipolar rating scales, usually with um, up to seven points, uh, by which one or more participant will rate one or more concept on each scale item. Um, and this scale is based on the proportion, proposition that an object can have several dimensions of connotative meaning. And these meanings are located in multidimensional property space called the semantic space. And connotative meanings are suggested or implied meanings in addition to the explicit meaning of an object. So in this uh, graph, the, the example of the SD scales, uh, this one raises the, the difference between T3%, which, is, which are Jones, Smith, and Williams, where they are uh, uh, counted in the three different uh, areas of evaluation, potency and activity. And there are two different polars, which the, the one on the left and the one on the right. So maybe you can see there's sociable and unsociable and then successful, unsuccessful, heavy or light, hot or hot and cold. So yeah, this graph, which uh, will make it easier for us to see the difference, uh, the difference between the, the, those three person and the weakness and their str strength in each uh, respectful area. And then we have the cumulative scales. So cumulative scales, given a person's total score, it is possible to estimate which items were answered positively and negatively. And a pioneering scale of this type was the scalogram. So the scalogram analysis is a procedure for determining whether 
a set of items forms an un, uni, uni, unidimensional scale. A scale is unidimensional if the response fall into a pattern in which endorsement of the item reflecting the extreme position resulting in endorsing all, all, all items are less extreme. That are less extreme. Assume, assume we are surveying opinions regarding a new style of running shoe. So in this uh, new running shoe, we have uh, developed a four preference skill, which are the, the first, the air soles, good looking. So the looks, the second one, the, uh, I will insist on the air sole because it's great looking. And the third one is the, the appearance of the air sole. And the fourth one is whether you prefer the air sole style to other styles. So then out of those, um, out of those four different scales that we have set up, um, the participants can, can indicate whether they agree or disagree. And, and if this items form an undimensional scale, the response patterns will approach the ideal configuration uh, shown in this um, scalagram. So item two is the most extreme position out of the four attitude statements where a participant who agrees with item two will agree with all four items. And the item are ordered in the scalogram left to right from most to, from most to least extreme. Um, if each agreement renders a score of one, a score of four, it will indicate all statements are agreed upon and represents the most favorable attitude. And persons with a score of three should disagree with item two, but agree with all others and so on. And according to this um, uh, scalogram theory, this pattern confirms that the universe of content or the attitude toward the appearance of this running shoe is, is, is indeed scalable. And so the scalogram and similar procedures for discovering underlying structure are very useful for assessing attitudes and behaviors that are highly structured, such as social distance, organizational hierarchies, and evolutionary product stages. And the scalogram is used much less often today, but it still retains its potential for specific applications. Next on how to develop proper questionnaire. So here we have the flow chart for instrument design. So during um, making uh, questionnaires, new researchers often want to draft their question immediately. Um, and, th their, and their enthusiasm makes them reluctant to go through the preliminaries that makes for successful surveys for instrument design. And the procedures followed in de developing an instrument vary from, uh, vary from study to study, but the flowchart suggests three phases and with each phases is discussed in this chapter, starting with the review of the research question hierarchy. So in the first phase, the revisiting the research question hierarchy, um, the measurement scale fall into one of four general types. The first one is the management questions. The, th the second one is research question. The third one is investigative questions. And the fourth one is measurement questions. So um, in the management questions, uh, they have the, de the, de the dilemma stated in the question form that the manager needs, to be re needs them to be resolved. And the second one is the fact that is based translation of the question the researcher must answer to contribute to the solution of the management question. The third one is the specific questions the researcher must answer to provide sufficient detail and coverage of the research question. And within this level, there may be several questions as the researcher moves from um, the general the general ones to the, the more specific ones. And as for the fourth one is the measurement questions, uh, which are the questions participants must answer if the researcher is uh, going to gather the needed information and to resolve the main management question. So looking back to the chart previously, you can see that First, they need to investigate. Uh, they have this the, the three different um, 
uh, the two different questions and then they have to prepare their preliminary preliminary analysis plan and then they will come up with the measurement questions and then they will uh, uh, create the instrument development um, which going to have some revisions during the during the process and this is, this is on during the second phase where they also done the pre-test individual questions and then after uh, yeah, this happened with the instrument development and the pre-test survey they're go going to have the instrument ready for the data collection so the second one the second phase is constructing and refining um, measurement measurement questions so the first one drafting or selecting questions will begin once you have developed a complete list of investigative question and you have decided on the collection processes to be used uh, the order type and wording of the measurement questions the introductions the instructions the transitions and the closure in a quality questionnaire will uh, should accomplish the following. So the first one, your questionnaire will encourage its participant to provide accurate responses. Uh, they will encourage participant to provide an adequate amount of information and they will discourage each participant from refusing to answer specific questions and discourage them from early discontinuation of participation and leave the participant with a positive attitude about the um, survey participation. So here we have the flow chart for instrument design on the, on the uh, second phase, which are the measurement questions. So as you can see, we have the administrative questions with the participant ID, the interviewer ID, and their locations and the conditions. And then we have the target questions from A, B, C, D, E. And then we have the classification questions such as their demographics, their econ economic background, their, soci their social background, or even their geographic background. This will be useful for the instrument development after. And then we have the question categories and structure. Um, so the questionnaire contains three categories of measurement questions. The first one is administrative questions. Second one is classification questions. And the third one is target questions. So administra administrative questions uh, identify the participant, interviewer, interview, interview location and conditions. And these questions are rarely asked of the participant, but are necessary for studying patterns within the data and to identify the possibility of an error of sources. As for the second one, they cover the sociological demographic variables, which will allow participants' answers to be grouped to reveal patterns, which later on can be studied by the researcher. And these questions usually appear at the end of the survey except for those used as filters or screens, um, questions that determine whether a participant has the requisite level of knowledge to participate. And then the third one, we have the uh, target questions that addresses the investigative question of a specific study that are grouped by a topic in the survey. And these target questions may be structured so they present the participants with a fixed set of choices, often called closed questions, where they don't have any um, other possible possible um, answers, and uh, or the unstructured questions, uh, which they do not limit responses, but they do provide a frame, a frame of reference for participants' answers, which sometimes uh, refer to be uh, an open-ended questions. So next one is the questions, content, and wording. So questions content is first and foremost dictated by the investigative questions guiding the study. So from these questions, the questionnaire designers or the, the researcher uh, will craft or borrow the target and classification questions that will be asked of participants. And they mostly uh, will have four questions that cover the numerous issues guiding 
the instrument designer in. So in selecting appropriate question content. So the first one is whether should this question be asked? Does it match the objective or of the study itself? And the second one is the the second one is the question of proper scope and coverage. The third one is can the participant adequately answer this question as asked? And the last one is will the participant willingly answer this question as asked? And although it is impossible to say which uh, which type of wording of a question is the best one, uh, we can actually point out several areas that might uh, that get, that can cause participant confusion or even measurement error. So the diligent question designer will put a survey question that can satisfy these uh, criteria. So the first one is whether the question stated in terms of a shared vocabulary or does the question contain a vocabulary with a single meaning? And does the question contain unsupported or misleading assumptions? And does the question contain biased wording or is the question correctly personalized and are ad adequate alternatives presented within the question? Then we have the, <clears throat> the response strategy. So a response strategy is a third ma major decision area in question designing. Uh, is the degree and form of structure imposed on the participant where the various response strategies offer options that includes three different responses. So the first one, we have the, the unstructured response or the open-ended response with the free choice of words and structured response or a closed response, which, is, which has specified alternatives provided. The second one, the free response, um, in turn, range from those in which the participant express themselves extensively to those in which the participant's latitude is restricted by space, layout, or instructions to choose only one word or phrase. Um, or you can call it an, a fill-in question. And then the third one, we have the, the closed responses that are typically categorized as dichotomous multiple choice, checklist, rating, or, rate, or ranking response strategies. So the several situational factors affect the decision of whether to use an open-ended or closed questions. The decision is also affected by the degree to which these factors are known to the interviewer. The factors are the objectives of the study, the participant's level of information about the topic, uh, the degree to which the participant has thought of uh, thought through the topic, the ease with which participant communicates, and the participant's motivation level to share information. Then we have the free response and dichotomous questions. So the first one is the free response. So it is also known as an open-ended question, where the partic uh, where the question uh, the 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 interviewer will ask the participant a question and they will pause for the answer, which is unaided, or the participant records his or her own ideas with their own words in the space provided on the questionnaire. And survey researchers usually try to reduce the number of such questions because they pose a significant problems in interpretation and are costly in terms of data analysis. And then we have the dichotomous questions uh, that suggests opposing responses, but this is not always the case uh, as where one response may be so unlikely that it will be better to adopt the middle ground alternative as, as one of the two choices. So for example, for example, if we ask participants whether a product is underpriced or overpriced, um, we are not likely to get many selections of the former choice and the better alternatives to present the, to the participant might be fairly priced or overpriced. So in many two-way questions, there are potential alternatives beyond the stated two alternatives. And if the participant cannot accept either alternative that's given in the dichotomous question, they might convert 
the question into a multiple choice question or a rating question by by writing in his or her own desired alternative. Um, for an example, um, the participant that that's uh, doing this research might prefer to answer uh, to give an answer such as a don't know answer to a yes or no question or prefer a no opinion when faced with a favor opposed option. Or maybe in other case when there are two opposing or complementary choices, the participant may prefer a qualified choice. So maybe yes if X doesn't occur or sometimes yes and sometimes no or even about the same. So thus the two-way question may become multiple choice or rating questions and these additional responses should be reflected in your revised analysis plan. And this dictonomous questions uh, will generate a nominal data. So next we have the um, multiple choice questions where they are appropriate when there are more than two alternatives or when we seek grad gradation of uh, preference, interests, or agreement. The latter situation also calls for rating questions. And although such questions uh, might offer more than one alternative answer, they request the participant to make a single choice. Then now we have the, um, the third phase, which is the last phase which is the drafting and refining the, the instrument. So as we can see on this, on this flowchart, uh, first uh, we need to develop the participant screening process, which are done especially with personal or phone surveys, but also with early notification procedures, such as sending out emails or web surveys along with the um, introduction. So after we've done the after we've after we've done the the first step, which is the administrative questions, uh, we can do the second step, which is to arrange the measurement question sequence. So we need to identify groups of target target uh, questions by topic. As you can see over there on the flowchart, we have the topic A, B, and C, and etc. And then we need to establish a logical sequence for the question groups and questions within groups. And then we also need to develop a transitions between these question groups. And then on the th and then the third one, we need to prepare and insert instructions for the interviewer, including termination instructions, skip directions, and probes for the participants. The fourth step is to create and insert a conclusion with instruments disposition uh, statement. And then um, the fifth one, we need to have a pretest specific question and the instrument as a whole. Okay, next we have uh, types of questionnaire administration. So questionnaires are really generally designed to collect large number of quantitative data. They can be administered personally, distributed electronically, or mailed to respondent. Questionnaires are generally less expensive and time-consuming than interviews and observation, but they also introduce a much larger chance of non-response and non-response error. An overview of the advantage and disadvantage of questionnaire and a section on when to use each of this method is well, well, is gonna be discussed in the next slide. Next, please. So the first one we have is personally administered questionnaire. And when the survey is confined to a local area, a good way to collect data is to personally administer the questionnaire. One of the main advantage of this is that the researcher can collect all the completed response within a short period of time. And any doubt, any doubts that the responder, respondent might have on any question can be clarified on the spot. 
researcher also has the opportunity to introduce the research topic and motivate the respondent to offer their frank answer. Administrating questionnaires to large number of individuals at the same time is like less expensive and consume less time than interviewing. Uh, one of the disadvantages of personally administered questionnaire is that the researcher may introduce a bias by explaining questions differently to different people. Participants may be in fact answering different questions as compared to those who, whom questionnaire was mailed. A personally administered questionnaire also takes a lot, of, a lot of time and a lot of effort. The next one we have is mail questionnaire. Where is when a self-administered can be used in a paper or pencil questionnaire that is sent to respondent via the mail. This method has been the backbone of business research, but with the arrival of the internet, mail questionnaire have been become redundant uh, or even obsolete. The last one is the common one, which is the electronic and online questionnaire. The distribution of electronic or online questionnaire is easy and fast. We have to, all we have to do is email the invitation to complete the survey, post a link on a website or personal blog, or even use a social net, networks. Online questionnaire are usually created as web form with a database to store the answer and statistical software to provide statistical analysis. Until recently, Conducting online surveys was a time-consuming and tedious task requiring, fa requiring familiarity with web authoring programs, HTML codes, and or scripting programs. Today, survey development software package and online survey services make online survey much easier and, much, and more accessible. Online questionnaires are often used to gain deeper understanding of con consumer opinion and preferences. One of their big advantage is that they make the, that it makes the most ability of the internet provide to access group and individual who will be difficult. A second advantage of online questionnaire is that a wide geographical area can be covered in the survey. A link to the questionnaire is sent to the respondent who can complete it at their convenience in their homes and at their own place. The automatic processing of the survey save further cost, time, and energy. However, there are also disadvantages to online questionnaire. When conducting online research, researchers often encounter problems with regard to sampling. For instance, self-selection and extremely low response rates make it difficult to establish receptive representativeness of the sample and generalize the finding because those responding to the survey may not all be may not all represent the population they are supposed to. Yes, so this is the full advantage and disadvantages of the uh, method of data collection. As I mentioned previously, personally administered questionnaire, mail questionnaire, and electronic questionnaire. We can see from the table there are advantages and disadvantages the two different methods of data collection. Next. So I'm going to be discussing about the validity and reliability in quantitative research. So um, validity refer to how accurately a method measures what is intended to measure. Uh, if research has high validity, that means it produces results that correspond to the real properties, characteristics, and variation in the physical or, or social world. Uh, several types of validity tests are used to test the goodness of measures, and writers use different terms to denote them. For the sake of clarity, we may group validity tests under three broad headings. Uh, first of all, is content validity, criterion related validity, and a construct validity. So, content validity refers to the degree to which an assessment instrument is relevant to and representative of the targeted construct it is designed to measure. It ensures that the measure includes an adequate and representative set uh, of items that taps the concept. 
the more the scale item represent the domain or universe of the concept being measured, the greater the content validity. To put it differently, content validity is a function of how well the dimensions and elements of the concept have been delineated. Criterion related validity. So uh, it is it's established when the measure of differentiates individuals on a criterion it is expected to predict. This can be done by establishing concurrent valid validity or predictive validity. So for the concurrent validity, it establishes when the scale discriminates the individuals who are known to be different. That is, they should scare score differently on the instrument. Secondly is the predictive validity. If it indicates the ability of the measuring instrument to differentiate among individuals with reference of future criterion. So for the predictive validity, the example is when an aptitude or ability test administered to employees at the same time of recruitment is to differentiate individuals on the basis of the future job performance. Then those who score low on the test should be poor performers and those with high score are good performers. Next. Construct validity. So it testifies to how well the result obtained from the use of the measure fit the theories around which the test is designed. This is assessed through the convergent and discriminant validity. For the convergent validity is established when the scores obtained with two different instruments measuring the same concept are highly correlated. And for the discriminant validity, it is established when based on theory, two variables are predicted to be uncorrelated and the scores obtained by measuring them are indeed empirically found to be so. Next. So uh, we're going to talk about reliability now. Um, the reliability of a measure indicates the extent to which it is without bias or it, it is error free and hence ensures consistent measurement across time and across the various items in the instrument. In other words, the reliability of a measure is an indication of the stability and consistency with, with which the instrument measures the concept and help to assess the goodness of a measure. Next. The stability of the measures. So the ability of a measure is to remain the same over time despite uncontrollable testing condition or the state of the respondent themselves is indicative and its stability and low vulnerability to changes in the situation. Uh, there is the pass retest reliability. The reliability coefficient obtained by repetition of the same measure on a second occasion. So, uh, example is when a questionnaire containing some items that are supposed to measure a concept it is, is administered to a set of respondent now and again to the same respondent, say to um, several weeks to six months later. Then the correlation between the scores obtained at two different times from one and the same set of respondent is called a, a, a test-retest coefficient. The higher it is, the better test-retest reliability and consequently the stability of the measure across time. For parallel form reliability, when responses on two comparable sets of measures uh, tapping the same construct are highly correlated. So for the example, it's when both forms have similar, similar items and the same response format. The only change is being the wording and the order or sequence of the questions. When What we try to establish here is the error variability resulting from wording and ordering of this question. If two such comparable forms are highly correlated, say uh, eight and above, we may fairly certain that this measure are reasonably reliable with minimal error variance caused by wording, ordering, or other factors. Uh, the internal consistency of measures. The internal consistency of a measure is indicative of the homogeneity of the items in the measure that taps the construct. 
In other words, the items should hang together as a set and be capable of independently measuring the same concept so that the respondent attach the same overall meaning to each of the items. So there is two types. Which the first one is the interim consistency reliability. It's the test of consistency of the respondent's answer to all the items in a measure. To the degree that items are independent measures of the same concept, they will be correlated with one another. The second one is the split half reliability which it reflects the correlation between two halves of an instrument. The estimates will vary depending on how the items in the measure are split into two halves. Next. So uh, these are the clear diagram of testing goodness of measure the, in the form of reliability and validity and how it's quite related. And it's very needed in, a, in doing a research. Next. So that's it from us. Thank you so much, um, class and Mr. Imam.